Hey guys, Three and Out has its own YouTube channel and we plan on doing coward type numbers. Here's the key. If you're watching this, you like our content, make sure you subscribe. Subscribe to the page, leave a comment, interact with our stuff. We do stuff on this page on a daily basis. 365, Three and Out podcast right here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe right now. What is happening? I usually do a little Golo golf podcast on recorded on Tuesday for Wednesday, but so much to happen today in the NFL. Uh, rule changes, streaming announcements, uh, Friday games opening weekend, the kickoff rule that uh, I, I want to touch on, and then obviously just some other stuff around the NFL. Robert Kraft said something pretty interesting. Uh, given where and his involvement on the documentary. Brian Dayball and the Giants acknowledge we got to calm down a little bit. And uh, something I saw come out with the 49ers that I think is pretty telling. Uh, th- th- they're definitely not happy about something that, uh, that transpired during Super Bowl week that I think they blame on the Super Bowl game. Not winning and losing, but when it comes to injuries. So just a ton going on in the NFL. I, I didn't have it mapped out, the owners' meetings, but... Holy cannoli. I mean, we got stories flying left and right. Obviously, all the coaches talked these last couple days. Sean Payton gave one of the great one-worded answers I've ever seen from an NFL coach. Love, I love honesty. Love transparency. I love people being authentic. Uh, I, I would imagine a lot of the former players on television are going to crush them. Couldn't have loved it anymore, though. So we, we might mention that as well. And podcasts all week. So uh, pedal the metal, baby. Football season. It's pretty far away, but we got the offseason and the draft right around the corner. Also got to do a little draft daily. Got to do a little draft daily. Uh, we got to mention the draft on every single day until the draft happens. That's that's a goal of ours. So uh, before we dive into some football, grab that smartphone. Very easy to do. Grab that smartphone. Download a little app called Game Time. When you download the Game Time app, use the promo code John first pair of tickets. You want to go to a game. I think baseball opening day is right around the corner. You want to go to a baseball game this spring, this summer? You want to go to a concert? Uh, I've already looked. You know, I I need to get out of the house. I've just been working nonstop, need to do something, uh, looking at some concerts online, something maybe even in a different state. Just mix up your mojo, mix up, get on a a little bird, go somewhere. Going to use Game Time. Download the Game Time app, promo code John. Save yourself $20, your first pair of tickets. Very, very easy to use. Just uh, don't forget that promo code. I appreciate everyone that's used it. Keep hammering it. If you've already used it, have your wife, your girlfriend, your father, your mother, have them use it. And uh, promo code John, baby. I think the NFL, I've been saying this for a while, is easily the best league at adapting the quickest. Doesn't mean it always works, but they, they try things and they are unafraid to immediately pivot. And we see this constantly with rule changes. Now, that sometimes it fails, sometimes it works. Remember the pass interference debacle when it came to challenging? That obviously didn't work. But we have seen a lot of positives when it comes to replay review, rules, player safety. Uh, obviously, you know we can nitpick all we want about the soft calls when it comes to quarterbacks. No one wants Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen. No one wants any of these guys to get injured. I, I just that's that their business model is very predicated on their star quarterbacks playing. But over the last couple of years, because the way the calendar fell, right, Christmas had been on the weekend. So it was a pretty easy one on a Saturday, Sunday, or Monday for the NFL to get involved with that day, right? So they just threw games on Christmas Day. And I, I think a lot of people started talking whether they would continue to do it because I didn't write it down. I was like, is it on Tuesday? It's on Wednesday this year. So in 2024, Christmas is on a Wednesday. And after the success of the television ratings this last year, people are like, are they going to stop? And anyone that's successful in business, when there's an opportunity there in terms of gaining market share, in terms of gaining revenue, in terms of hurting your competition, you double the fuck down. And that's what the NFL is doing. They are placing two games on Christmas Day that it lies on a Wednesday this season. And I think forevermore, 
the NFL will play games on Christmas, which used to be the NBA's turf. They'd have five games starting bright and early till the night. They now are an afterthought, and the NFL realizes it, and they're trying to put the nail in the coffin and take over that day, which they already have the last couple of years, but they're not giving the real estate back. They plan on owning that. If you ask me, I would have put three games on Christmas. I get it. The Wednesday, it's a little complicated. They will still play on Thursday, on Friday, on Saturday, and on Sunday, and then on Monday. So it's not like they're not playing. Maybe they're not playing on that Saturday because of the quarterfinals. I think Field Yates wrote it because of the new college football playoffs. But this is the least shocking development of anything to come out of the owners' meetings. It, it, it really is. Because the NFL has proven now, I, I've been saying this forever, you can complain all you want about ticket prices, about in-game experience. They don't care. They make their money off you sitting on your couch and watching the game. And let's face it, some of my Jewish brothers and sisters, maybe you're not celebrating Christmas, a large percentage of America, and even if you are Jewish, it's not like you're working, you're at home on Christmas Day. That's why the NBA had a built-in ratings increase on that day in the history of my life. So everyone's at home. And then the NFL said, not so fast, my friend. We're coming, and we're not planning on leaving ever. So... I'm glad as someone who wants to watch football on that day, as someone who loves to consume football, we all win. And I was thinking about this. The NFL is Maria last night. We were in bed kind of up late. It's like 11, 1130. And she ordered some pants on Amazon. And when we got up this morning at 645 AM, the box was in front of our door. They delivered a pair of pants in six or seven hours. The reason Amazon is arguably the number one company in the world, we can debate revenue, NVIDIA, all the shit, but they they treat their consumers better easily than any company I've ever dealt with. You ever have a problem? You just send it back. Literally type in anything that you want to find. It's always cheaper on Amazon. And then you press a button and it's literally there within 12, 8, 24 hours max. Obviously, some things take a little bit longer, but they're so consumer friendly. And forever, that was Bezos' entire thing. I care about the consumer. I will do whatever to make them happy. And the NFL, I would say, obviously does some things to piss us off. Some of the rules, uh, you know, some of the the officials, right? Which you can only, you can't control human beings, but they're pretty piss poor. But in terms of, supplying us with inventory, supplying us with things to watch for four and a half months a year. They've been great. You know, they they really have. Everyone talks shit about Thursday night football forever. And then you realize when Thursday night football is done at the end of the year, you're like, I kind of miss it. I don't want to watch a college game on Thursday anymore. This is National Football League's night. And I think we're going to be saying that in 10 years. Christmas is the NFL's day. You could argue... We're already saying that because based on the ratings, it already officially is their day. The other thing they did, which I, I understand, listen, I I live in America, so I can't speak to, you know, the German football market or the UK football market, or they used to go to Japan. I get why they do that, right? You, you want to expand always in terms of more fans worldwide. This is a domestic game. One pet peeve of mine has always been, And I get why they say it, right? Because I don't even think they think about what they're saying. Like, we're world champs. You're not world champs, you're Super Bowl champs. Like, the world does not play this game. We do, right? If you want to say, hey, I I win the Masters, I'm the best golfer in the world, right? Or even if I win the NBA, it's it's the best players internationally play in the NBA or hockey. You You could argue, say, world champs. Baseball. Baseball's played all over the place. Clearly the best players play here. But in football, like, there's no league going on in Russia, right? (laughs) Uh, They're not playing football in China, right? People that, maybe they are, but obviously this is, we're not competing with the rest of the world. It's always a pet peeve of mine. And people say it all the time. I think even Jason Kelsey at his retirement speech said it was an honor to be a world champ. No, you're Super Bowl champ, which is an incredible honor. But neither here nor there. 
the NFL obviously opens up Thursday night every single year. The Chiefs will do it this year. Wouldn't shock me if it's Chiefs maybe with Harbaugh or Sean Payton. Be a pretty easy one. But then on Friday night, they're going an international game in Brazil with the Philadelphia Eagles. And that game is not going to be on Fox. It's not going to be on CBS or NBC. It's going to be streamed on Peacock. The NFL realizes, and whenever I see Roger Goodell, that he doesn't think a Super Bowl is going to be streamed in his lifetime, I think we underestimate how things change, how quickly society is moving at this current pace when it comes to technology. Think of what the phone has accomplished in the last decade in terms of the userability of what a cell phone was. It's 2024. So a decade ago was 2014. Think how much things changed over that period of time. Well, how much do you think things are going to change from 2024 to 2034? It's going to change at an exponential rate because we're already this far. Think how the power of YouTube over the last three or four years, the cord cutting, the, the death of legacy media, but where we're at now and the growth of podcasts, right? How many more people, which is still a smaller percentage, but over the next five years relative to radio. I said forever, I, I knew I was onto something in podcasting, why I went all in and never crossed my mind to go back in radio in 2016 because everyone streamed from their phone. And all the cars, the moment you get into a car, now we have almost 15 years worth of cars. You hop in the car, what do you do? You don't search 1025 or 956. You connect your phone to the Bluetooth and you listen to whatever you're listening to. It was like the paping moment. And that was seven, eight years ago. And I was probably behind many people right? Thinking like that. But that's the power of it all. And the NFL, Brazil, I don't quite understand it. I don't even care. Like, I, I get why they do this stuff. But streaming on Peacock, like, we saw the success. They streamed a playoff game on Peacock. And they will again this year. It was also reported that Amazon will also have a wild card game as well as Thursday night football. So this notion, whenever I see these headlines coming from powerful people, we're not even close to stream a Super Bowl. Bullshit. Like, I, I, I don't believe that at all. If you told me in the next 10 years, is it possible a Super Bowl is streamed, I would say 1,000%. As Chris Mannix, I heard him say, I think he was on The Herd uh, maybe within a week or two ago, maybe he said this on his own podcast, that Jake Paul and Mike Tyson on Netflix will easily be the most watched fight in the history of boxing. And it won't even be close. Simply because accessibility. However, how many people have Netflix? 250, 275 million people in the in the world? How many people in this country? Well over 100 million people have it. You just press a button. So, I mean, they get, and they can put it on their front page. They get 20 million people watching that with their eyes closed. They don't even have to try. They control. Right? When you go to Amazon on Thursday Night Football, it's front and center. It was the same thing with Peacock. So the league, and this is what the other leagues don't have. If you put a first-round playoff series in the NBA on a streaming service, I don't think they would get any more. They, they would actually get less people watching than they would if it's on broadcast TV. Obviously, in the NFL, if you put, let's just pick a, a holiday, Thanksgiving or Christmas, one of those games was streamed only. Well, we saw the numbers, 30, 40 million people watch on the holidays. I think if you put it on Peacock or Amazon Prime, you might not do 30 million, but you're doing 24, 25, at, at least 20 million people. I think if you stream like an NBA or baseball situation, you're not sniffing a million people. So the NFL is no longer worried about the competition of attention from other sports. It's simply focused on the prog progression of where the world is going. What did you watch last night? Because I know what I did. We streamed Peacock. And before that, a, a show on Peacock about these ranchers in Missouri. It's, it's like a reality show. It's kind of entertaining. And before that, we watched Love is Blind, which is the stupidest best show I've ever seen. Uh, I, d I don't think I will ever watch it again, though. Uh, I got into it early, kind of wanted to bail late. But once you're in, you got to finish it. That was on Netflix. I, and then she was working late. I watched Full Swing on Netflix. Like beside a game, a live event, there is nothing I'm watching on regular TV anymore. Nothing. So, and I don't even have cable anymore. My whole life is streamed. 
everything. And I know, depending on where you live, the accessibility, internet speeds, that is only going to change and become stronger and stronger. Elon's developing, you know, already developed Starlink. Like the world is going to change at just crazy rates. And the NFL realizes this and they're all in and they're showing you, they can say whatever they want. I say this all the time about any human. I don't give a shit what you say. I don't care about what moral high ground you are tweeting or Facebook posting. I judge you by your fucking actions. So the NFL can say what they want about the future and the loyalty to the broad. They're showing you where they're going because who's going to have the money? Amazon, Netflix, even NBC for them to survive. And they are taking a bloodbath on the traditional network NBC. It's going to be because of Peacock and the success of Peacock was, I think, I forget the exact number off the top of my head, but it was like 20 million people watched the playoff game. And I think I saw a headline the other day that 70% of the people that signed up for that playoff game are still users today. So obviously it is very advantageous for these companies to be in bed with the NFL. And uh, separate from the game being played in Brazil, I mean, that's going to be fascinating. But the, the NFL loves these international games, clearly. Uh, I, I, I'm I sure they, they can quantify how many extra fans, the international. Obviously, was, the other thing was streaming. And this is what I realized in radio a while ago. Like, when I did a radio show in the Bay Area, people that listened to me were in the car in the Bay Area. Right? That, that was the overwhelming base of the people. Now I do a podcast. I get people from Australia, from the U.K., that are stationed in Japan, that, you know, live in Italy, Germany, wherever. It doesn't matter. The, the world, as Kyrie Irving would say, is literally flat when it comes to technology. Well, if I start streaming on Netflix or Amazon, I don't know exactly Amazon's foothold internationally, but Netflix for sure, and I'm, I know they're not on Netflix, but it feels inevitable one day that Netflix gets into the football game. Like, why do you think Netflix signed with the WWE? It's not just about New York and Los Angeles and Houston, Texas. Like, if I live in the UK, if I live in Chile, I can fucking watch it. So that that is the power of where this world's going. And it's just has never been like that with Fox and CBS and NBC previously. So it's, it's cool to see kind of the maturation and where we're headed. I, I like this stuff. I find it fascinating because ultimately this is the type of stuff that keeps the health of football going and pays for the league and keeps everyone, you know, moving forward and, and the league to grow financially, which has to happen for the league to stay on top. The thrill and excitement of March mania is here and DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top rated sports book apps is giving new customers a shot to turn five bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, don't forget DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code JOHN, J-O-H-N. New customers can bet five bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code JOHN. The crown is yours. Uh, the the other big news today was much more granular football, the kickoff rule. And I forget the exact year they changed the PAT from like, you know, a 12-yard kick back to a 35-yard kick. And Belichick was, if I remember correctly, was the guy pounding the table for the move. Basically, like, what is the point of something that is almost 100% certainty? Obviously, the occasional blocked PAT or the guy would hit the upright. But for the most part, it was borderline automatic. Borderline automatic. Just move it back. It's not going to go to 50%, but there will be a variable. And looking the last couple of years, there's like a 6.5% chance. So it went from 99 plus to like 93 to 94% in that range that a guy's going to miss. Dude missed a PAT in the Super Bowl. Now, granted, he was a little shaky throughout the year, but you watch the PAT in the regular season, you see it all the time, and you never know when it's going to happen. Now, it's not like it's become some play that you can't miss. Like, if you got a 
take a leak and you're watching the game, once they score a touchdown, like you can get up and go. And then, then you come back, you're like, where's the other point? And you're like, oh, I missed the field goal. But the kickoff has become very, very boring. It, it, it really has. And watching all these special teams coaches talk today, I saw the dude, the Saints coach, who was on with McAfee, saying that of the 13 kickoffs in the Super Bowl, none of them were returned. And 12 of them went out of the end zone. Now, granted, it was a controlled environment. It's indoors. It's not like there's wind pumping in Cleveland or Baltimore. But that's a problem. That takes a play. 13 of the plays during the Super Bowl are just completely irrelevant. And they flipped it. And they changed it to the XFL rule, which I had to brush up on. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the, some loyal XFL viewer in reading about it, that basically the kicker lines up at the 35-yard line. The kickers, you know, tackling guys all line up at the other 40-yard line. And then the offensive team, the team receiving the ball, lines up at the 35-yard line. So basically, instead of one team lining up here and running into the kickoff return team, which is scattered throughout the field in very, very high-speed collisions, anyone listening to this, if you played high school or college football, if you played in the NFL, and you ever were on kickoff return, and you weren't on the front row, I remember in high school, my freshman year, we went to a jamboree with Grant High School. It's where Ontario Smith went to school. It's, they, they, I don't know if they still are. They were really good in the 90s and the 2000s. They put a bunch of D1 dudes. It was a stack team. And they had some athletes. And I remember my, the first time I'd ever played padded football, my first action, not like scrimmage against your own team. And I remember turning around. And seeing this dude running so fast, I just remember, I flew. I mean, the guy hit me, I fucking flew back. I always had so much respect, whether it was pros, college, anyone that lined up on that unit. It was a violent play. And especially the guys on the kicking team just barreling down like fucking kamikaze style. And the NFL wants to take that out, and they have for a while. And I thought they were like going to ban kickoffs, right? So this to me, is a much better outcome than just getting rid of the play. And clearly, when the offense and the defensive blockers and tacklers are lined up five yards apart from each other, one's at the 40, one's at the 35, and they are not allowed to move until the returner catches the ball. So these crazy collisions that obviously happen less and less throughout the history of the game today than they had before because kickers are stronger now kicking off the field just make it kind of interesting and seeing a couple clips from the XFL, like you could put two returners back there. You can do end arounds. I also think this brings into play in a tighter game. If I'm the 49ers, why don't I put Debo Samuel back there? If I'm the Tennessee Titans, why don't I put Tony Pollard, Travis Etienne, or Saquon Barkley, or I don't know if Derek Henry would be great at it, but like put a, put a dynamic. If I'm the Miami Dolphins, you know who I'm putting back there in a big game? Fucking Tyreek Hill. And I consider maybe those are two or three of his touches. Because from the 20-yard line through the goal line, I have to return it. I do not have a choice. I have to return the ball. I think this adds a huge element of just intrigue. This play, especially as people are feeling it out, is a must-watch. I sound like I'm like a, on a Roger Goodell's front office team. I just find as a fan that gets bored very easy, just in general, I'm pretty intrigued by this. And I like the penal nature of, you kick it out of bounds, it's going to the 40-yard line. So you better not try to get tricky here. You better keep this bad boy in the field of play. I think this play just went from completely irrelevant and honestly getting kind of stupid to fascinating. (laughs) It really has. And special teams coaches already have a ton of time did they they think of crazy things to begin with? I used to work with them in college and the pros. They're a different breed, man. They, they, they really are. I, I think we're going to see some fun shit. We're also going to see some debacles. I mean, we are going to see some disasters. You could argue in a big spot. I said Tyreek Hill or Saquon or Debo. Why wouldn't I put like Fred Warner or Roquan Smith, one of, one of my best defenders, back there to try to make a tackle? Because it's just an open field tackle. 
I don't have to worry about him having some crazy collision. It's really more diagnose, shed, make a guy miss, make an open field tackle. I, I think the uh, we're, I think we're going to see some big name players. I don't mean all the time, but throughout the season, play on this unit, one thousand percent. I would actually bet a lot of money right now that we constantly see impact players in closer games, second half on this unit. Some other stuff going around the National Football League today. Obviously, a lot of coaches talk. I mean, every coach talked the last. I mean, the best thing I saw, without a question, was when a reporter asked Sean Payton if it was a tough decision given the cap hit that the Denver Broncos would take to cut Russell Wilson. He said no. That was it. I I really appreciate, and I don't think we get this enough in pro sports. Everyone's so sensitive of like, some people just don't like other people. I've been in free agency meetings. I've been around NFL coaches. They talk a lot of shit about players they don't think are any good. Yet they would never say it if you put a mic in front of them. Yet they all think it. And same goes for players. A ton of players hate a ton of coaches. But if you ever interviewed him, they would be, yeah, the guy's good. You know, it's very rare, like when Shady McCoy was crushing Eric Bieniemy. It's very rare. It's easy to crush a coach you don't know. But a coach you played for, coordinator or head coach, to be critical of him, it rarely happens. And most coaches are just beat around the bush when it comes to players they don't like. So I appreciate this. I really do. That's why going back to Sean Payton, talking shit about Nate Hackett, to what happened. I, I, we need more of this. We need more crazy. Like, this is all entertainment. And I think sometimes coaches can be so cliche-driven and so boring. Like, that's not how they actually think. That, that's not what they're actually saying when they're sitting with their GM or their coordinators. I want that guy, right? It's what we used to get with Hard Knocks, why I said I was kind of out on Hard Knocks. Because back in the day in Hard Knocks, you kind of got this raw, unfiltered feel for the staff that you just don't get anymore. And that's clearly gone because everyone is like walking on eggshells. Like, I can't offend this guy. Sure you can't. I mean, who cares? We're all human beings. Just talk how you talk. And people are not willing to do that, except Sean Payton, who's clearly the throwback of Bill Parcells still in the NFL. Speaking of a guy who's somewhat of a loose cannon, uh, I mean, hell, he, he admitted it, was Brian Dayball. There was an ESPN.com article that says, he basically, he acknowledges that he needs to work on his emotions and calm down. John Mora said the same thing. Like, sometimes I would like Dayball to calm down a little bit. There was a moment, actually, I think I said this at the Combine, when I got on an elevator and he walked and he came right, he was looking right at me, walked in, and I was getting ready. Like, he's probably going to light into me for what I had said on the podcast that went viral in Giants land. And I know for a fact that they were talking about it in the building and he was asking people. And I was ready. Listen, I, I said it. So it's like, if he had a problem with it and he wanted to take issue with me, like part of being fucking part of the business, like what, what am I going to do? Uh, even Cause I don't, it's not like I, I take back anything I said, I, I was right about everything I said, but he has the right to defend himself or get mad. Like I would have had no problem with it. He was like, Hey, what's up? And uh, obviously there are, I think two versions of this guy, the version that you get in the, you know, the coaching staff and the way he acts, not even on game day, it's not a sustainable way to operate. It really isn't. There's nothing wrong with, as a head coach, quote unquote, being considered an asshole sometimes. You have to tell people things they don't want to hear. Coaches and players, part of the deal. Part of the hierarchy of the way the sport is set up. You're not, you're going to be not happy-go-lucky 24-7, 365. There's a ton of pressure. Like, everything is about and comes to you. Like, you're the decision maker. But his emotions, even he acknowledged, are completely out of control uh, too often. And my take is, listen, I, I've dealt with emotions my entire life, controlling them, knowing when to harness them, not losing my cool. It's not easy to do. It, it, it really isn't. And the only way you can improve on it is when you're in those situations. Like, you can't practice it, I, I don't believe. I mean, you can co you can consciously think, about, you know, whether it's taking deep breath or relaxing a little bit. But if your personality oftentimes is your personality, like that's who you are, right? Dan Campbell, energetic screamer, right? Bill Belichick, 
kind of quiet, more cerebral. Andy Reid, Pete Carroll, much more positive, happy-go-lucky guys. You kind of are who you are, especially the older you get. Most human beings, especially successful rich ones, which Brian Dayball is definitely a wealthy one, don't typically change at 50. They can try. I mean, we all try to change and get better. I just think it's a difficult proposition, especially when pressure comes in. And let's face it, they're going to have a ton of pressure. And the other thing is like, are they any good? I know their defensive line's pretty good on paper. But is their offense any good? They easily lost their most productive player over the last couple of years. They keep saying over and over that Daniel Jones is going to be their starting quarterback. I don't know. I think it's a very, very difficult situation. I know, I know John Mara said they can take a quarterback if they want to take a quarterback. If I'm Brian Dable, I don't like, I, in theory, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. But like, what if I'm not here to coach this quarterback in a year because we win five games again? That's a major problem. I'd much rather just have a receiver or Brock Bowers or an impact player who can help me win week one. Uh, Robert Kraft was kind of cornered, uh, like a lot of owners, by the local media and discussed the dynasty. And he said that. He really liked the first three episodes and he wished they would have focused a lot more on, you know, the the winning streak and the Super Bowls instead of a lot of the controversial topics. But then if you've watched it, and Mike Florio pointed this out in one of his blogs, that at the end of every episode, it says Kraft Dynasty LLC. Now, no one truly asked him, like, what's his involvement? Was he a producer? Does he own the documentary? But clearly, he was involved financially with this documentary. And I played golf last week with a guy from Boston. And he says the all the radio shows are talking about it back there. All of his buddies are talking about it. They all think, like the word is, and any Patriots fan knows, they use this to try to help get Kraft. Like Kraft did this to try to get into the Hall of Fame. So it's like, Robert, you can't act. Like, yeah, you know, it makes Bill look bad. I wish it would have done this and this. Like, well, what's your involvement? I think that I think the crafts are in for one of the greatest come to Jesus moments in the history of ownership. I've seen it before firsthand. When the 49ers ran Jim Harbaugh out of town, they hired Jim Tom Sula. And they went through one of the two the worst two year stretches in the history of the franchise. They were a joke. It was, and and Jed was getting destroyed. Now, I'm not saying Gerard Mayo is Jim Tom Sula. I think he's a high-level guy. I think he's smarter than Jim Tom Sula. But one, the picture did him no, no uh, was not good for him at the owner's meetings. Looked like he wore a T-shirt, didn't even know what was going on. They don't have a GM, even though Elliot Wolf technically is kind of running it. I think Jonathan Kraft clearly is kind of in control. I would short the Patriots hard for the next couple of years. I think it's going to be really, really, really ugly. And I, I, I think that Kraft, and listen, I, I don't blame him for getting rid of Bill. Like, uh, to, things come to an end. You had two and a half decades worth of kicking ass, making money, winning Super Bowls. And then Brady left and it ended. Welcome to sports. But I, it just feels something's off. And I think these owners and everyone's been talking about this around the Patriots. They wanted their team back. They wanted their team back. You know what the best owners do? They let their coaches and personnel people run everything and they just print the money. They own the team. They sign every check. It's your fucking team. Yeah. Okay. Now you have a guy who's nice to you. Smiles in the hallway. Great. It's about winning and losing. That's all that matters. Um, And last but not least, I saw Dre Greenlaw had one of probably the more famous injuries in the Super Bowl ever because he tore his Achilles running out to the huddle. I don't think we've ever seen that before. The 49ers also had one of their coaches, the DB coach, tear his Achilles on the sideline celebrating an interception. And I heard this at the Super Bowl, and then I heard this again at the Combine, that the 49ers believe remember they were mad about the field the chiefs got the raiders which al davis is still rolling over in his grave that the chiefs while they were winning a super bowl and preparing for a super bowl used his facility but they got an nfl facility which 
Andy told me it's the nicest thing he's ever seen. And the 49ers got UNLVs, which basically might as well be like a D7 football program right now. And they were complaining that the turf was just not up to standard. They brought in some grass. They didn't they didn't feel comfortable. And deep down, they blamed Dre Greenlaw's Achilles injury, just like they blamed their assistant coach's Achilles injury on the wear and tear on this weird field. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but they believe that. Here's what I know would be a simple solution. If you're going to the if you're having a Super Bowl and you're going to a place like Vegas or a city that does not have Alabama or Ohio State or like USC, like a legitimate college that's like competing for national championships that has basically the facilities like an NFL team would have. You have to split the NFL facility. This is what they should have done in Vegas. One team gets it in the morning. The other team gets it in the afternoon. The Raiders literally built the Taj Mahal of practice facilities. And one of the teams had to practice at UNLV. I remember saying this in the Super Bowl, like, I get, why don't they just, why did they set it up like this? So next year in New Orleans, I don't know what two lanes facilities are, but one of the teams is going to get the Saints. It's usually the NFC team, right? Why don't both teams just split it? So no one has any beef with any of the college setup. Just one team gets it from 8 to 11. The other team gets it from 1 to 4 for four straight days. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Monday, or whatever the day setup would be because usually Tuesday's off. It's very easy to avoid. Don't make a team. Yeah, this team's uh, practicing at this, uh, you know, D1AA program. Yeah, they had to go to this local high school. Like, what What are we doing? <laughs> How, it doesn't make any, and I'm not making excuses. Like, maybe it was Achilles was going to tear. But I remember thinking it was stupid that one team had to practice at this way shittier facility. When you have all day. Like, they're not, they're not holding their meetings there. They go back to the hotel. It's very, very easy. 8 to 11, 1 to 4. That's your allotted time. Boom, done. 